we study the different neurotransmitters in their brains to kind of compare um, the differences between humans and non-human primates. Um, I also work in genetics and study genes related to differences in uh, behavior in primates as well. Um, I guess, well, I guess a little bit more in-depth background. I'm originally from Iowa, so I went to the University of Iowa and I studied anthropology. So when I first got there, I didn't even know what anthropology was. I was like, people just spend their time studying humans and culture and human evolution. Um, and immediately I just really loved it. So I got into that and it led me here to study uh, brain evolution. So that's how I got here. <laughs> Hey, that's excellent. So the plan today is that you're going to talk about a researcher first, and then um, after that, um, our students, students will be asking some questions, and then you will give us, give us a tour of the lab, and then we will ask more questions, right? Yeah, sounds good. I um, I put together just a couple quick slides. I think it'll let me do like a window share, right? It'll let me screen share, I think. Um, yes. Okay, I'll try to make sure and see if it's, see if it's going here. Okay, so you guys can see my screen? You guys can see? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I just put together a super quick, um, just a couple of slides talking about our research. So um, yeah, the lab that I work in, the laboratory, um, she's called a principal investigator. So she is like, she has her PhD, she runs the lab basically, and she's been working on this type of research for many, many years. Her name is uh, Marianne Raganti. And her lab basically studies uh, primate brain evolution. And one of the major questions that we're looking at right now is, you know, what is the neural and neurochemical basis of primate social diversity? So when I say neurochemical, it literally just means like oh, the different molecules in the brain that are being shot all around to make the brain do what it does basically. It's super complicated and there's a ton of them, um, but we basically just focus on a handful of them and try to characterize what they look like in the, the, the different primate species. Uh, so, for example, on the screen here, uh, the ones that I chose here, on the bottom left here, we have like chimpanzees. Um, the top, we have uh, gibbons, and the little guys, those are marmosets. So, these different primates have very different social behaviors. Uh, for example, in the chimpanzees, you'll have large groups of uh, like males and females living together, and you'll see lots of aggression. They're very aggressive, and you'll see lots of male aggression, um, and even a lot of like inner group, like really like almost violence. You'll see. Um, very smart though; they use tools. Um, and then if you, the, the top two primates their social behavior is very different. So with the gibbons, the black and white, uh, the, the black and white apes there, they form like monogamous bonds. So kind of similar to what you could think of as humans. Um, and then the little guys, they live in these like small family groups where they all kind of pitch in to take care of a couple of offspring. So very different. And we want to kind of know more about what is it in the brain and these chemicals that, you know, lead them to uh, behave in these different ways. So some of the past research that I've done, um, I first started off in the master's program here in the anthropology department. And I became interested in these monkeys that I have pictured here. They're called macaques. And there's about 23, 24 different species of macaque monkeys. So what's really interesting about them is that even though they're all very closely related, they all have these different social styles. So for example, it says like the rhesus macaque on the left, this macaque is pretty aggressive. They have very, very strict dominance hierarchies in their social groups. Whereas all the way to the right, uh, the more macaques, they, they're more like egalitarian. So they kind of are a little more equal in terms of their social stance. There is a ranking, but it's, it's a little more flexible. 
and there's not as much of that very intense aggression to kind of keep each other in their places. Um, so I was interested in, in these monkeys specifically. Um, and I have a, a brain specimen out that I can show you of the Japanese macaque, the one that's uh, the one that's huddling there. Um, so yeah, so I studied the amygdala. So this brain region here, um, if you've heard of it, you'll probably have heard that it's involved in like fear, like the fear response and detecting threat. Um, so a lot to do with like emotion, aggression, lots of different social behaviors. So I studied uh, this molecule here, serotonin, in the amygdala. Um, so I compared this molecule in the different monkeys to kind of get an idea as to, you know, could this be contributing to the different types of social behaviors we see? Um, and I didn't put any of my like graphs with results on here, but I did, we did find a couple differences with the uh, Japanese macaque had the highest levels of serotonin compared to um, the pigtailed and the more macaque. So we, we did find some differences. Uh, we can't say for sure if it's associated with these different behaviors, um, but it's interesting to, to see how uh, these monkeys that, you know, are very, very similar are actually different in terms of their brains. Um, so related to that, I'm really interested, uh, I'm studying right now the Japanese and rhesus macaques uh, quite specifically. So the Japanese macaques on the left, you can see they're like super chill. They actually like, they actually go down into these hot springs, these natural hot springs in Japan. Um, that's the only uh, country they live in, Japan. And they relax in these hot springs and they look really cute when they do this. Um, and they also live in these areas where it gets very cold and there's lots of snow. So you can see them huddling really close together. So that's kind of a, a behavior they use to keep warm. Whereas the rhesus macaques, they live all over in like in like South Asia. Um, so they have a they have a larger range. Um, they even live like near cities. They live in a lot of different places in Asia. And uh, they, they don't display a lot of the behaviors that Japanese macaques display. So I'm, I'm looking at genes that could be associated with these differences in behavior. Um, so we, in 2017, I went to Japan to study the monkeys and we looked at a specific gene um, called MAOA. And this gene basically is involved in how much of the, it, it regulates how much neurotransmitter is in the brain, um, certain neurotransmitters. So we found differences between the two species and this may be involved in some of their social differences because it directly impacts how much neurotransmitter like serotonin is actually available to do its thing in the brain. Um, yeah, and then I just included some slides on uh, Japan here. Um, the program that I'm in, they have a collaboration with uh, Kyoto University in Japan. So I was able to do uh, research there and I'm gonna go back there this summer to continue doing research. Um, but I just included a slide of um, my lab mate and one of my advisors and then also the uh, professor I worked with in Japan this was at a symposium um, earlier this earlier last year. Yeah, last year. Um, and then also in Japan, they had us have host families and mine was just so great. Like we became like really close. So the first on the left with um, the dog in my lap is the first time I was there. And then I went back like a year, a year and a half later. And then we like met again and it was just like, so nice. They're just like my Japanese family now. Um, so I'm sure I'll see them again when I go. Um, but yeah, that's all I have. I just wanted to keep it, keep it pretty short and sweet and just give you kind of an idea of what I do. Um, yeah, do you guys have any questions or do you want to move straight into like the lab tour? Good one. The lab tour first or lab tour first. <laughs> Okay, cool. Okay, so right now I'm actually on my lap. Yeah, I'm on my laptop. So let me see if I can pull this. Okay, so I am in 
my lab. <laughs> this is the this is the uh, the first small room of the lab. So when you walk in, you basically have um, this is like the microscope room. So I pulled up here. I'm not sure if you can see it very well. Like here is where we would work on the microscope to do the analyses of the neurotransmitters and look at the different, um, like we would like use this program to count the different neurons and do all of that stuff. So I pulled up a slide here. This is from one of the macaque monkey picture, the macaque monkeys I showed you. This is like a region called the hippocampus. So this region is involved in like memory um, and that's what that looks like. So there are literally so, so many brains in here. We keep them all in um, these covers. There are like zillions of boxes um, and each box has like a zillion slides in them with brain tissue on it. So there's brain tissue on all of these slides and it can be a handful to keep organized. <laughs> um, but like I said, my advisor has been working at this for a very, very long time. Um, so we've been able to do quite a bit of cool research. Um, so this is like the large main area um, of the lab. And um, so this is where all of the experiments go down. We uh, work with the actual brains. Um, the brains are actually stored when we get them from like research institutes or like there's like national primate institutes that um, we get our brains from or zoos when animals die. Uh, we keep them in here. It's just like a walk-in fridge. Um, so like down here, like lots of like chimpanzee brains. Um, we have like lots of different monkey brains. There's some whale brains. Um, yeah, that's where we keep all the brains at. Um, let's see, what else? So one of the things that we have to do when we get the brains is like we have to act, we have to actually like, slice them up, and it takes a very very long time. <laughs> but we do it on uh, what's called a microtome. So here, it's it's actually really just like. If you've been to like a deli where they have like the slicer, it's literally just like that. Like we we used uh, dry ice to freeze the brain, and then we mount it on to this uh, stand here, and we literally just like slice it, like 40 micrometers by 40 micrometers, slicing it. And I have cut myself on it. I was very scared. I thought I was gonna get a monkey disease, but I didn't, so it's fine. Um, so that, we do that there. Um, let's see. We also do experiments where we can analyze like different, um, different like blood or serum. Um, we can use tissue to measure the levels of like the molecules in the tissue. So this is a system that we can do that with here. And then, let's see, over here is where I do, like just like at the general like bench area, is where I do the main experiments related to the neurochemicals. So the process for that is basically, you treat tissue with lots of different chemicals to prepare it to, uh, use what's called an antibody to detect the specific protein you're interested in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lengthy process and it takes over two, it takes two days in total for the, pro, for the protocol that we use. Um, but at the end, all of your proteins you're interested in, like the serotonin uh, related proteins, they're all like um, labeled with like a dye. And then we can take it to the microscope and um, do the analyses on the microscope. So here I just got out, um, this is like the Japanese macaque. Um, this is their brain. It looks a lot just like a mini version of a human brain. Um, the shape is a lot different. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can see this well. Uh, let's see. 
And yeah, so basically we would get the brain and it would be like a full brain with two hemispheres and then we would uh, chop it in half and then we would further divide it into different areas. And then that's when we take it over to the microtome and we can like slice it into areas in this uh, coronal, per in this coronal um, orientation. So that's basically what we do. Um, yeah, so I also work in the genetics lab, but that's like down the hall and it's kind of a hassle to get in and out of because there's it's like always alarmed and all this stuff. So I won't go down there. Um, it's not really that cool because it's like everything is just in small little tubes, even though there's like DNA in there. It just, you would never know because everything is very small. Um, you really can't see much of anything. You just hope everything is going well in your experiment and at the end. Hopefully you have results basically, but um, yeah, so we can go with questions or whatever you guys want to talk about. Oh, so last second, so we have uh, her question first and then yours. So you know what's your question? So what do you find the most interesting about your job? Can you hear her? What do you find most interesting? Say, what, what, what is the best thing about my job? Right, right, right. Yeah. You said yeah? Yes, yeah. The best thing, the best thing. Um, so as a grad student, um, we, we do research and then we also teach too. Um, so I think that I really do love doing research, but I think what really uh, drives me and motivates me is teaching. So when I have students, like undergraduate students working in the lab with me, I'm teaching them how to do the different experiments um, or I'm like giving a lecture on human evolution and uh, teaching a class. I think that is, probably my favorite part. Um, I also really enjoy learning new lab techniques. So I think once you do the same lab technique over and over, it becomes kind of, it, it does get boring kind of. So it's one of those things where you have to be really dedicated to uh, your goal in order to keep coming back and doing it again and again. Um, so yeah, I would say those, those things, my favorite. We have another question right here. Um, Hannah, what's your question? Oh, my question is, um, how did they pick that specific, you know, breed of monkey compared to like the orangutan or any other breed? Her question is, why did you pick that particular type of monkey instead of, you know, orangutans or? Mm -hmm. um, so I specifically have focused on the macaques. Um, just because like their species, they're like, uh, their species, there, there are many different species of them and they differ in social behaviors. Um, so because they're closely related like genetically and we see these differences in their social behaviors, it becomes interesting to kind of ask, you know, oh, they, ha they are very similar in terms of their DNA, but how is it that they, you know, came to behave in these different ways? So I can look at things like how do their genes differ in small ways or how are their genes regulated or is it something with the neurotransmitters? So I, I, like, I like it in terms of um, what their group offers, the questions that I have. Um, I mean, our lab does study overall, like other students do study um, like orangutans and they're involved in studies too. Um, just up to now, I haven't included them. Um, but in terms of like the great apes, so like orangutans, chimps, bonobos, and humans, there's just not so many. There's just really aren't that many. Um, and but they do have a very diverse social aspects too. So they're definitely worth studying. I just am kind of really into the macaques for some reason. I just really like them. So. <laughs> So in high school, like the high school I went to, it was, it was just like a public school. It was actually kind of, kind of rough. Like my hometown is, is kind of, um, 
it's it's not the greatest. It's like well, I'm from Waterloo, Iowa. It's not the greatest. My my high school it, it got me through. It taught me what I needed to to know. Um, but then I got to college and I had always been really good at science. And I was like, oh, I'll just like go to med school. Like, of course, I'll just study pre-med. Um, but then I started taking all these different classes because like with, you know, liberal arts education, you're taking like a bunch of different classes just to fill requirements. So I was taking classes like anthropology and I was like, I don't think I want to um, like specifically work with people in terms of like treating them and learning about biology for the sake of just problem solving and um, working in like the hospital environment. So I was really interested in the questions that um, I was learning about in biological anthropology. So studying human evolution, because in high school, we hadn't studied it much. Like we learned a bit about it, but in college, I realized like there were so many questions that were very interesting that I wanted to try to answer even a little bit. Um, so yeah, I was just really inspired in college. Um, and then I researched different professors at different universities who were doing research that I would like to do. So um, just looking at their lab websites and I came across um, my current advisor, uh, Dr. Raganti, and I came to visit and apply to the program and it just ended up being a really good fit. So um, yeah, it just really started with exploring the different areas. So I would say even if you feel like maybe if you think you know what you want to do, um, always have kind of like an open mind and um, really kind of explore a bit. If you, if you have the opportunity to do so, um, take that time to really, you know, feel, find out what feels right. Um, because you'll never know unless you unless you have these experiences. So, yeah. Um, so, in regards to the monkeys, do does the environment that they um, live in does that affect their chemical composition in their brain? That's a really good question, and I wonder that because. Um, so if, so we're studying brain evolution in my lab, but in order, so evolution functions, it doesn't, it's not something you can see by looking at one individual animal. It happens over long periods of time and monkeys live a decent, a decent lifespan. So it's not like I can study them in terms of looking at like a thousand generations of monkeys. Um, so I wonder about like the Japanese macaques, if they, since they've been living in these uh, cold areas, they likely have, have these, well, they have been found to have these like cold environment adaptations. So this could be related to like their body composition in terms of them being able to like stay warm in these environments or maybe even their diet. So the environment has definitely played a role in shaping their biology through time. So I think that a large part of um, interpreting the results that I get from these brain studies is thinking about it in terms of the environment that the monkeys have evolved in over a long period of time. So it's, it's like, it's, so it's, you really can't talk much about um, these results without considering the environment. Um, it, it when it's talking about evolution, so for sure, yeah, definitely. So I guess the question you have is uh, uh, whether this, um, you know, the weather, whether it's warm or cold affects their social behavior even? Yeah. They, uh, whether like, they so kind of tend to sit together. You know, yeah. go out and explore or see if you can leave the room. If, if it's, it's warmer, weather, yeah. Mm -hmm. If it's cold, you want to stay in the room and keep warm, you might not be able to survive. Mm -hmm. oh, that's why they kind of you know, all sit together and not. Right, group survival strategies, right? Yeah, exactly. Because, so 
the Japanese macaques, they will form these huge huddles. It could be like over a hundred monkeys. They come together and they've been studied, they've studied the social dynamics of these different um, huddle structures. So they found that say for example, in the daytime when it's not as cold and it's sunny out, they'll have a certain type of social dynamic going on. But at night when it gets really cold, the weather changes and it gets very cold these social rules that have been in place, they become more flexible. They, they won't be so angry and, you know, nitpicky about who's up close to them because they need to survive. They need to stay warm. So in the day, in the daytime, when it's warm out, they could be like, I don't mess with this monkey. Like, I don't, you're not, we're not my friend. You're not friends. Like, you know, stay away from me. They're aggressive. But then at night, it's like those rules become more flexible. So uh, definitely it's all about survival. And um, they, yeah, they found that it's, it's pretty flexible in terms of like their social behaviors. And even with other monkeys too, like the rhesus macaques who live in like these urban areas. Um, I don't know so much about these type of behavioral studies, um, but I'm sure they've come up with their own ways to kind of navigate these environments and even interact with humans or you know, try to survive in a different way because they're in close contact with humans in terms of where they live. So, for sure. Um, I have a question about how often do you run into the issue of neurological diseases and how you go about in, in the specimens that you receive? Um, so how often do we come across, you said disease? Right, like pathological yeah, tissue, like, like looking at the brain, maybe it's on the brain, uh, obviously you can see there's a neurological disorder or disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, um, so, so when we get brains, um, typically, well, they have been, um, for the most part, they've been treated with chemicals so that they've been like fixed. So all the proteins and everything and the structure of it is preserved basically. And just by looking at it, sometimes you can't quite tell if there's pathology or not, um, but there are ways to go about studying it. So you can use specific uh, like molecular markers. So you could do an experiment where you specifically want to test to see if you can detect a molecule that is known to be involved in like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, which is a component of the research in the lab. So those researchers in our lab who study that, they take the different primate brains like monkey, the rhesus monkey, uh, chimpanzee and human, and then they detect the pathological molecules to see if in Alzheimer's, for example, we know what the molecules look like in human brains, what, what the pathology looks like but we don't know if that even exists so much in chimpanzees or if it is the same. So we found that, well, not we, my lab, I'm not part of that one, but my lab has found that the chimpanzees do display some of these um, typical pathological markers, but it's not clear if this is associated with like this cognitive decline that you see in humans. So even though they may have what looks like pathology, it could be that, you know, it's this type, this molecule that we're seeing isn't acting the same. So it's important for us to realize that and we can use that to understand, okay, how do we, how, how are they able to have this pathology but still be, have their cognition intact? And we can learn from that to um, try to help with human um, pathologies. Um, there are other pathologies that would be more, on like the gross anatomical scale where you could like look at the brain and see something's wrong. Um, but for the most part, the, the monkeys that we're getting there, they don't have pathology. We kind of want them to be, you know, make just normal monkey brains from like the, the primate institutes that we get them from. Um, so, so we really come across monkeys and um, primates that are like surprised to us that if they have pathology or not. I wonder, do you guys have the information about the, uh, you know, the primates' health before uh, their brains were sent to you? Like, you know, how did they die? What kind of condition they have? Or the age? Can you, yeah. Do you have match information? Yeah. So most of the time, we yeah we have we have the age, the sex, like where they came from, 
uh, all that information we have um, for in terms of like how they die either in some cases like they'll be sacrificed for the research in other cases it other cases not if if they die from like a specific sickness or if it's known that they were sick um then that would be noted too so we would have that information going into it in case that we do see some abnormalities that we wouldn't expect with like a normal brain how do you measure the amount of dopamine in the brain in a monkey brain and then compare that to a human have we? How, how do you measure the, the amount of dopamine in the monkey brain and compare that to that of a human? Do, do you have human brain in your lab? <laughs> yes, we do. And that's, that's it's really cool that you said that because um, do, what, what do you know about dopamine? Like, why did you say dopamine? I just read uh, one of the articles that our teacher linked. About oh, okay, cool. Oh, yeah, he shared those with you. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So dopamine is, yeah, so that was a study that had been um, going on for a while, and it was kind of like right around the time I first got here that all of the results were kind of coming together. Um, so dopamine itself is related to like the reward system. Um, so like when you eat or something and you're like, it kind of like, it's like a rewarding um, feeling you have. So to keep you going back into for survival. Like that's how it starts out, but then that can kind of overlap with other rewarding sensations that we have as humans related to like addiction and everything. So like addiction itself can hijack the reward system and get you in the cycle of, oh, that was rewarding. All this dopamine is like flooding my system and I'm feeling this rewarding, you know, perception and keep going back. Um, so a major thing with uh, that research is kind of trying to figure out like what is it about the human brain or is there something about the human brain in the dopamine system that kind of predisposes us to have all of these like addictions and uh, reward system like I guess issues you could say um, and, you know we're finding that um, there's a lot more dopamine in the human reward system than the other primates so it could be that it's just like ultra sensitive or it's just easy for it to um, kick in in terms of like the different things that are perceived as rewarding. Daniel, uh, dopamine, is dopamine a protein and serotonin, are they both proteins? And you were saying that, you know, because the proteins have been uh, fixed uh, when the brain was brought to the lab. So you basically, I guess, you know, um, isolate the proteins and then compare the amount using Western blood or I guess so for so for our uh, so for our studies we we look at things like the different uh, transporters or receptors um, or um, enzymes that are the precursors for these molecules so we're not looking specifically at like the dopamine itself that molecule or serotonin itself we would look at um, like for serotonin we could look at the serotonin transporter which is a protein that uh, modulates how much serotonin is available in the brain um, in what's called like the synapse, the, the area between the two brain cells. Um, so, by, so by labeling that with um, the antibodies, the antibodies can detect that specifically. And by labeling that, we can see which, which cells are serotonin cells because they are the ones that have the serotonin transporter. So those are the ways that we can work with um, the fixed tissue because with the, there, are some, there are issues with having these, uh, these chemical fixatives in the tissue that don't allow us to do everything we'd be able to do if it was like fresh um, tissue. But we can have um, frozen tissue, which was frozen quickly after it was uh, harvested from the animal. And that allows you to do more of like what you were explaining with like the protein purification and things like that. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a smaller component of, of the lab. Um, some studies do incorporate that, um, but the main thing is like the, um, what's called the immunohistochemistry where, where we do the antibodies to detect uh, proteins. I have a question about what it's like to be 
see in the lab. You mentioned that you like to work with undergraduates and teach them and, and work on, on social structure. So can you talk a little bit about the social structure of the lab? How yeah. So my lab itself is pretty small. The anthropology department here is a component of the biomedical sciences program. So at Kent State, you have like the biomedical sciences, then you have biological anthropology, like cell molecular pharmacology, and I think maybe two others. Um, so in this specific lab, it's pretty small. It's like me, um, another uh, PhD student, and two or three other master's students. Um, so it's pretty small and we're all doing like, we're, we're all using similar methods. So a lot of the time we're doing like similar experiment types in the lab. So, um, so yeah, we, I would say that um, in terms of what it's like working in a research lab, depending on the size and the type of research you're doing, it could definitely be something that going into it, you wouldn't expect it to be um, as, it, it can be pretty tedious, honestly. It's, it's something that you start off and you're, and you're very excited because you're learning, but as you go on, it's, it really takes um, discipline and uh, perseverance to keep going and coming back and doing it again and again to collect large amounts of data. Um, and being in a small lab, a lot of times, maybe you're there by yourself for the whole day. Um, so I think I've learned that balancing my lab work with teaching or um, having undergrads in the lab really helps me feel like connected and uh, keeps me motivated. Um, coming into this, I thought that I was super introverted and I was like, yeah, being by myself all day in the lab is great. Like, I, that's just what I'd love to do. But then I was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of alone time. Like, I really missed being around people. Um, so, so when I started teaching, I was like, oh, this is great. Like, I can teach and then I can also do research. Um, so, I've, so as I've gone through this program, I would say that I've learned a lot about myself in terms of you know, what environment I work best in. And that's something that I think a lot of people would say they either really love that, you know, being kind of like in your own zone for a long time, like long hours um, versus interacting with people. Um, so it's something where you really have to kind of get to know yourself more um, to kind of keep, you know, to stay connected with people and not just be like in a hole in the lab for 12 hours, 10 hours. Um, but that's not to say it's not worth it. I, I really do love it. Um, it just takes some balancing for sure. What advice would you give us for like doing research? So, our, so this is a, a class of students who are taking, who are learning about uh, how's the uh, research methods and you know, designing an application. Mm -hmm. uh, we are actually in the process of, of writing a, an NSF style proposal. I know that you, uh, very young into your career, you received the NSF uh, grant, right? Um, mm -hmm. Is there any advice? You know, can you share some experience um, you know, that you have? Mm -hmm. you, know, you get into that you know, uh, challenges and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I would say that, you know, all of the research always starts out with this interest you have, you know, you're curious about something and, you know, you, you read something and you're like, what, like, that's so strange, or you have a question. So, you know, you get online and you start reading things about it um, to see what's known. Like, that's always first step to see, like, you know, what's out there already, like, what, what do we know? Um, and then after that, after gathering that background information about a topic you're interested in, um, you kind of start to see, you know, what other areas need to be further looked at in, uh, for this topic. So from there, you can come up with a question like, you know, I want to, so molecule A has been known to be involved in anxiety but no one has looked at this molecule in terms of what it does for 
like sleep. And I know, and you, but it seems like research is saying that anxiety and sleep are related. So how do I form an experiment to study that? And then you also have to take into account what resources are available to you. So if you're in an environment where say you have mice or rats available for you to work with, you should be thinking of methods or questions that you can answer with the model system of mice that you have available to you. If you have more leeway where you can look at, you know, you have different model systems or you have the opportunity for whatever reason that you can um, choose, you know, you, you, can, you can be a little more, um, it can get a little more complicated. But usually there's that limitation of, you know, what lab am I in? What, what do I have available to me? Um, so yeah, I, I would start thinking about the, the system you're working in at that point. And then, um, and then next think about specifically what method is best fit for the question that I have. Um, do I want to measure protein levels? You could, then you could look down different ways to measure protein. How specific do you want it to be? Do you want it to be kind of just like a general, like more or less, or do you want like a specific value, very specific amounts? Um, so I think it's kind of like this, starting with idea, background research, um, consider the system you're working in, and then consider methods that will help you answer your question. Um, I would say it, it can be challenging because, um, but I, I find that coming up with the questions isn't isn't the challenging part. I think that the get, figuring out um, the methods it it's really time intensive a lot of the time to to learn these methods and it can be quite frustrating when you're first learning because maybe they don't work. Maybe you spent three eight ten hour days working on this and nothing comes of it. You know, so a lot of times you, you feel like you're not making any progress. Um, so you kind of have to keep telling yourself, like, each, even when you fail, you're, you're moving forward, which sounds super not true, but it is. Um, I tell myself it a lot, like, just because it doesn't work doesn't mean you're not, you're not moving forward in your research. Um, so that's one of the things, um, try not to be discouraged. If your first, you know, plan doesn't go through, um, you just jump to something, a different, a different plan. There's always something else you can do. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about how you, uh, like when you were writing the proposal, like, you know, how, uh, was that in your second year or first year, you know, greater program that you uh, won this uh, grant? Yeah, it was in my, um, I would have, I, I wrote the proposal my first year of, um, of grad school when I first entered the master's program. And um, it was a situation where my, my advisor kind of came to me and said, oh, there's an opportunity. If you apply for this grant, then you could work with our colleagues in Japan. Um, so at that point, she kind of gave me room to you know, explore areas that were related to primate, um, you know, genetics or neurobiology um, within the realm of what I, what methods I knew that I would be able to work with. Um, so I had some kind of guidance in terms of, you know, the different methods I knew I could use um, and what monkeys I would work with. So from there, I am I honestly, you know, I was interested in like aggression. So the gene that I looked at um, that I mentioned um, that we published our results on, that gene specifically is associated with um, like aggressive behavior, different variants of the gene. So I started reading a lot on that and found that, you know, this was something that I could look at in these different macaque species um, to further understand the biology of aggression. So from there, it was just writing, um, writing up what I learned about the background. So the, the grant itself, you know, it had like background information, methods that I would use. So I would describe the methods. Um, um, and then also like the, the, you know, why it's important, the intellectual merit, as well as you know, the broader impact. So you're doing all the science, but they also want to know, you know, how are you contributing? What is your 
how are you helping society with the science you're doing? Um, so that was also a component I had to write on. Um, really, it's just having someone who is going to, you know, read your proposal and give you constructive feedback, and then you go back in and, um, you know, edit it and kind of toss it back and forth between you and your collaborator, your advisor, your professor. And yeah, it's just step by step, just get, just keep polishing it and making it um, as nice as possible um, throughout the process. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I actually kind of enjoy, I pretty much enjoyed writing it because, you know, it gives you time to really think about this, this topic that you're interested in studying and you kind of build up this excitement for being able to study it. But then it's the moment of, oh, I'm submitting this grant. <laughs> Are they going to give me money to do this? So that, that's the scary part. Um, but it's still very fun. And um, if you don't get one grant, you can always apply for another. So you can, maybe, maybe you'll be bummed out if you wouldn't get it, but there's always more. Um, I remember the funding ratio is less than 10%, right, for the National Science Foundation uh, funding. Like, ten out, nine out of 10 people will not get it. Right. Yeah, right. It's, they can be very competitive. Yep. So, um, and, you know, and the process is, you know, they you have these reviewers from these, um, it, you know, relatively related fields reading these and determining, you know, which projects will likely be successful and useful and things like that. Um, so a lot of times when you're writing these proposals, you don't want to be so like field specific. You, you don't want to use too much like jargon that's very specific to your field because the people that are reading it may not be as familiar they'll you know be able to follow but you don't want it to be where they can't even quite understand because they study something you know different um so also the language that you use i you know was kind of struggling with that a bit trying to like word it in a way that it would clearly come across to someone say if they you know didn't study genetics what if they studied like immunology or something like or what they said could be totally different I wanted to make sure they understood what my goal was and all of that stuff so I also wonder um, when you compare uh, these different primates um, for that one gene for example that's involving aggression did you find any any difference like number one is do you see that there is a match to how we understand uh, the cl how close do the different primates really relate to humans versus you know the amount of you know maybe that gene uh, being expressed? I would think that humans are less aggressive, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Also for the serotonin, like do you see that same profile? Like you know uh, the closer it is related to humans, and then maybe there's more serotonin in them. Did you find that yet or no? Mm. So for the um, so for the gene that I study that's related to you know, a serotonin availability, the MAOA gene. So I was, I mentioned like in the study that I did, the different, the two macaque species, I was looking at that gene, but I was looking at which version of this gene. So there were different like alleles, so different versions of the gene. You know, they were, they were doing the same thing, but they were um, maybe expressed at a higher or lower level. So I wanted to know if the rhesus macaque versus the Japanese macaque, did we see that these monkeys had different frequencies, different, you know, numbers of these two different or several different gene variants that would then be associated with higher or lower expression of the gene. And we found that the Japanese macaques had a, a significantly higher amount of a specific gene variant that would be associated with higher levels of serotonin. And, um, and, and that makes sense because and other studies have found that compared to the Japanese macaque in the rhesus macaque, the, the Japanese macaque has much higher levels of serotonin even in their, in their blood. Um, so yeah, so we found differences with that. And what's interesting is that um, the MAOA gene, they have these different, the monkeys have different variants so do humans. So similar studies have been done in humans where some people have high activity of this gene. So more of it's being uh, 
encoded produce this protein is there um, versus others who have low. So even among you in the room, you could have, you have all of you have this gene, but maybe some of you make more of this MAOA, which could lead to less serotonin. So, so when we think about it this way, we have this variation in, in how our brains are functioning and our predisposition to certain social tendencies. So, you know, personality, if, if we're prone to depression or anxiety, and these genes are involved in that. So as we see these different variants, we see that they can be associated with differences in predisposition to the psychiatric disorders. Um, so that, so it's important that if we can assess this in primates, we can do studies to find out more about how these different variants work to affect social behaviors and maybe use that information to help humans in terms of like psychiatric uh, disorders and things like that. Um, I wonder whether um, you, know, you don't study human very much, mostly uh, other primates. Uh, do other are there any other lab that study this gene just to see whether you know, they're they correlate to you know uh, crime rates, you know the the uh, possibility of committing crimes versus you know uh, mental disorders things like that or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a lot of like the background research that I've done, has, like just, just like reading about it, those types of studies that you describe, um, these different variants associated with personality traits or um, psychiatric disorders, um, things like that, that kind of really sparked my interest to see if we've seen it in primates as well. Um, so there have been... Um, studies that look to see if like the gene that I mentioned, the MAOA gene, if that gene is associated, like a certain version of that gene, if, if a person has that, do they tend to be more like antisocial? Do they tend to be more aggressive? And the thing about that is there are lots of mixed results. So for example, with humans, there's lots of room for, you, you, mm, so, so actually with humans, it's very difficult because humans are really complicated and it's difficult to control for lots of different factors. So the experimental design could be having a, a play, could be playing a role in the, the mixed results that you see. Um, but more likely it's the case that it just goes beyond what gene is there or isn't there, what version is there or isn't there. There are so many complex levels to how these genes work you can have um, how they're regulated. So what other proteins are triggering that gene to produce its protein? Um, or for example, a study that I'm doing now, it looks at um, like epigenetic modifications to, the, to these genes um, to see if that plays a role in potentially like social behaviors in these monkeys um, or the same thing can be done for humans. Um, so, so, even, so even if the gene is exactly the same, it could be that something is going on in there that is affecting that gene and it's not, you can't detect it just by looking at the gene sequence. It's something very complicated like that you, that you would never be able to detect unless you really search for it. Um, so yeah, the association studies with personality and things like that have been done. It's just not clear in terms of like associating one gene variant to a certain social behavior, just because it's very complicated. Okay, one more question right here. Uh, how much of your time do you spend reading other literature to kind of uh, parallel or something that might contradict what you're currently working with? Mm -hmm. I would say that depending on like what my, my goals are for the week, um, if I'm planning on doing writing, I would definitely be reading a lot too. And that could be something where, you know, I would spend like the morning or something reading quite a bit. So maybe just like several hours in the morning reading um, and then kind of like compiling these notes and using that to do my writing later. Um, so I would say like several, depending on the week, I would say it could be um, several hours to many hours or some weeks if you know it could just be very little depending on like if I'm doing like a lots of intense like lab work that week where I just 
my focus isn't on reading on things like that. But it's one of those things where you kind of always keep your eye on like research related to what you're interested in. So you would have like alerts come into your inbox on related research that had been published and you could quickly read it and see and then you'll see something you're like oh that's real cool so you'll click it then you'll read it so like you can you just you're kind of always having something coming in basically Brandon. what's the most you think you found through your study uh studying the brains of the primates studying the brain of primates do you find anything that's really kind of caught your attention excited or um most exciting to you. Like you do something new to you, I guess, the first time you saw them, like sort of a surprise maybe. <laughs> I um, I would say, um, so I'm, so, an, I've, so in the past I've studied serotonin, um, but now I'm studying, and I've studied it in the amygdala, and now I'm studying um, the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so I'm studying the endocannabinoid receptor in the amygdala and what's really strange is that like the cannabinoid receptor one of their receptors is like so abundant in the brain it's like everywhere it's like the most abundant but we don't understand why so i, I saw so i stained for this cannabinoid receptor and this is basically like related to like thc and like pain and feeling good and um memory, things like that, all types of things it's related to um, that we don't quite understand. Um, but I stained for it in the amygdala and it was just so dense staining. It was just everywhere. It was just so much of it. And um, it's just real curious to me that like, I just didn't expect it to be s just so intense. So I'm really curious about uh, the results I'll get. I'm doing a, a large scale study from like monkeys, like apes, humans for the uh, the cannabinoid uh, receptor. So um, yeah, it was cool to see that it was like, whoa, so much of it in the region that I study. Um, so we'll see if we see any differences between monkeys, apes, and humans. And then the next part of that to see, you know, what those differences could possibly mean. Um, yeah. Um, so, the brain type to um, analyze between the monkeys and the humans, uh, what age range? Is it like a specific age range? Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So usually the ones that um, that I work with, they're usually like adult monkeys, so we don't want them to be too young where they're still like developing, so their brains would be kind of like not quite like the normal adult but we kind of try to keep it in between like adult range where they're not too old or too young but the studies that look at like alzheimer's pathology they're you know have a range between like young middle age and then the oldest of the old is the oldest that's available for us to get um so it really just depends on the question so we could possibly use old ones if we specifically want to see if there's like markers of neurodegeneration in the old monkeys or apes or humans all right, one last question. Um, you, um, we have a lot of minority students here, um, female, a lot of you know, uh, women who want to become scientists. Do you have any advice for them? Like, did, did you face any challenges being a female minority student? Um, mm -hmm. and what kind of advice would you give to them if they mm -hmm. want to follow your, you know? I would say that, um, yeah, I've definitely faced challenges. I would say that it's something where, that's a big question. I'm trying to think how, <laughs> that's a big one. What is the best advice I could give? Um, I would say definitely do it. Definitely do it. Um, so what really interested me in anthropology was how the study is of humans. So we're studying all things human, how humans are biologically, culturally, socially, all of that stuff. But all the people who studied it were like white. And I was like, brown, black, whatever people are human too. We think about why we are the way we are. You know, we, we have these questions just like everyone else. And it really kind of made me think, you know, 
geez, it, it sucks that there's not as many people studying these types of questions. So with any type of science, you know, it's really necessary to have that broad scope of background. Um, is that directly impacts the type of questions that are being asked? Um, I would say definitely, um, oh, that's really hard. This, is, this should be like an easy question, but it's not. Um, I would definitely say just, you know, don't, don't uh, be intimidated by, you know, the environment that you find yourself going into. So say as you go into university, say, say as you go into university, um, you know, you may feel like maybe like you're out of place or you don't maybe fit in or your background's like super different from everyone else. But I would say kind of try to like push past that and push, push, my lab, push, past, that, push past that and, you know, just keep at it. Um, and it's something that will definitely take lots of perseverance. It'll take lots of dedication. Some days you'll feel like you're done. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm over it. Like, let me just get a normal job. And some days you'll be like, just remind yourself that it's like, this is awesome. Like I get to wake up every day and I get to ask questions and I just get to be human. Like humans literally are just really curious primates who are asking questions, making stuff, doing really weird things. So literally being a scientist is just being able to wake up every day and do that. Um, so I would say just keep reminding yourself that you know you do belong and um, to keep at it for sure. Thank you so much, Lynette and Weiss. Um, our time is up. Thank you so much. I think we learned a lot from you. Um, and you, if you don't mind, can our students email you, contact you if they have questions? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you, email you, and then we'll share the contact, I guess. Um, thanks, thanks a lot again. Um, yeah. I guess we're bye to you now. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.